Hi, I'm Greg Yulon with Reynolds & Reynolds, and this is Connected. Uh, today's a great day. I get to talk with two guests, uh, not in studio, but but uh, remote. They're in lovely Denver, Colorado. Uh, I highly recommend it if you haven't been there recently. Uh, I get to talk with uh, Jake Trott, who's the VP of Account Management, and Jason Tuck, who's the Sales and Marketing Manager at Automotive Warranty Network, or AWN. Uh, Jake and Jason, thanks so much for sitting down and talking. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. Yep, absolutely. The sun's shining there, it looks like. Yes, it is. It's a beautiful day in Colorado. <laughs> good, good. Um, well, guys, why don't you start with a little bit of your background? I don't know, Jake, maybe if you want to go first. Um, you know, how long you've been with AWN? Actually, you know what? First, why don't we get into what does Automotive Warranty Network do? Uh, just at a really high level, just to give people a little background and a little context, um, and then maybe a little background on, on both of you. Yeah, so AWN or Automotive Warranty Network is a company that processes manufacturer warranty claims, and we also have an, an auditing and training division, um, just kind of on a higher level with AWN. Um, I have been with AWN for four years. I started on the auditing and training side of things, um, and then transitioned over to the account manager side, and now run the account management division. Good deal. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, I really appreciate you guys jumping on because warranty work is it's got it has such a big impact on the dealership business. But I don't think it gets talked about that much, and I'm not really sure why uh, because it is you know it's a pretty impactful part of the business. So um, excited for this conversation. But uh, Jason, I, I didn't let you introduce yourself. Why don't you give a little bit of your background too? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I've been in the automotive industry for 21 years now. Started off as a technician. I, I wrote service for a while, and then I was a service manager. Uh, I thought I was going to get away from the car business, so I, I moved over to the sales side for about two years and uh, didn't really get out of it. And then uh, nine years ago, I moved my family from uh, Virginia to Colorado to come work for Automotive Warranty Network. Uh, and just uh, it's an amazing uh, company that we work with. And like you said, you know, warranty plays uh, it, a big role in the dealership. However, it's kind of like forgotten about. It's that piece. It's like, OK, well, someone's just going to submit the claim and get us paid. So. Uh, it may not be the most exciting job, but uh, we make it exciting and fun here at AWN. Yeah, no, that's great. That's great. So what uh, you said you moved from, um, you know, East Coast out to out to Denver. Yeah. Um, you said you moved for for the job. But I mean, that's that's a big move, especially if you have a family. Yeah, it's a, it was a big leap. I mean, I, uh, I have two boys. Uh, they were young at the time, uh, a wife, and we were grounded uh, where we were and had a support system and took a leap of faith to, to move all the way across the country uh, away from family. Uh, but the great thing is, is AWN is my family. Uh, we run a family-owned business, and uh, it, is, it is operated in that fashion. Everybody is family here. Yeah, no, that's great. That's great. So being out there in, in Colorado, are you guys sports fans? Uh, yeah, yeah. A little, I mean, some positive, some negative right now, right? You got, uh, I don't know which which teams you follow necessarily. I, I'm a big baseball fan, and the Rockies are off to a little bit of a, a rough start. But I mean, you got the you got the Nuggets who are first place in the West, so yes, yeah, we got we got the the Nuggets and and Avs are the uh, the pride and joys right now. It's kind of changed. <laughs> so I'm a native in Denver, uh, born and raised here. You know, growing up, it was always the Broncos first and everybody else second. And that has kind of changed over the last eight years. Um, you know, we've we've had a, a very big culture change where it's a basketball and hockey town more more than a, a football town now. Yeah, no, it's it's interesting as you know, teams come and go and players come and go. How that can how that can fluctuate, but yeah. Um, all right, so let's get into into warranty uh, work a little bit, and I guess to start maybe. Um, and I don't know the answer to this question. I don't know if you do or not, but you, you probably have a better idea than I do. You know, when you think about warranty work and you think about the dollars associated with it, do you have any idea, um, you know, how much money is left on the table maybe every year by dealers or, you know, a, a, a different token, how much money's lost in audits? Um, any, any idea on that? Again, I don't know the answer to it. So if you don't, that's fine. But I was just kind of curious if you had an idea. Yeah, it's a hard, uh, hard matrix to, to quantify because uh, we look at it from a standpoint of we're going to collect everything that the, the dealership is entitled to. It all depends on the technician's comments, uh, the, the, cor the correct building that claim correctly and submitting it over correctly. Uh, and then the dealership side of assuring up any issues. It, are they getting customer signatures? Are they getting out, -on -out authorizations? Are they doing the right repair? according to policy and procedures. So um, typically 
the service department's average is about 30 to 40 percent. It can be higher uh, depending on on the the manufacturer, but 30 to 40 percent of the service department's revenue is pertaining to warranty. Uh, so that's a big a big factor uh, in what the dealership is collecting, uh, and you have to shore that money up because there's a lot at risk. Right, right. Well, and and also, you know, it's. I don't know. You tell me, but my my assumption is, when you look at the the numbers, you know, there's not a ton of warranty only ROs that are going to come into the shop, right? If you're doing a good job with an inspection and doing a good job upselling, um, ideally, you're not going to have just a one line RO with warranty work on it. Ideally, you're going to have warranty pay work and customer pay work in the same in the same ticket, right? Sure, absolutely. Yeah, as a service manager, a previous service manager. I never wanted a one-line RO. Right. Uh, that means you're not doing your job by checking brakes, tires, doing that multi-point inspection. You're missing opportunity. And we know these customers, they're they are not like thrilled to show up at the dealership and have their car serviced or have a repair done. Uh, but if they need work and you're not selling it, that's a missed opportunity. So it's very important that the dealerships are, are following uh, those multi-point inspections and checking the vehicles over properly because there's opportunity for them. Yeah. Yeah. So talk about, and you hit on, on a few of them, Jason, but talk a little bit more about, um, you know, any issues that you guys see. So, well, I guess start with, cause you, you're in a lot of dealerships, right? So how many, uh, start with how many at bats you're getting over the course of a month or a year, you know, looking at, um, at warranty work, right? How many ROs are you actually kind of processing as a company? Cause I think that matters, right? When you think about a dealership an individual dealership and, you know, you might do a couple hundred a month, which is a lot, right? That's, that's great. You're getting a lot of reps, but, um, when you have the, uh, the breadth that, that you and your team do looking at, at ROs really across the country, across different OEMs, and, and you're able to pick up on best practices and know what to look for. Um, you know, how, how many ROs are, are you and your team processing, you know, a month or a year? So we don't really quantify it by how many ROs that we're touching. We look at it as a volume standpoint. Okay. Our, our average clientele, their, their volume and warranty receivables per month is averaging around 250000 a month. Uh, depending on the manufacturer, that could equate to uh, six, 700 ROs a month. Uh, but the admin is reviewing every single RO, and we look at it at a compliance standpoint. You know, We want to make sure that what we're submitting is good money. It's right. going to stick. Uh, we don't want to just sling it up against the wall and see if it sticks, because we know the manufacturer is going to come back and try to recoup money if we did something incorrectly. So our average clients around $250,000 a month um, and the admins have to review every single RO for compliance and maximize profit because the dealer doesn't want someone that's just going to get bare minimum and, you know, not try to get that extra money that's entitled to, uh, to them. So uh, the admins are skilled to go in and look based upon what the tech story says he did look up labor operations that apply to that job and what he says he uh, performed. Yeah. Yeah. So based on all that experience, um, you know, and all those reps over and over every single month, um, you know, what are some of the, the things that stick out to you, common issues that result in delays or um, things that can be missed? Any any highlights, you know, maybe if you had like a top three list or something like that, are there anything, uh, any things that stand out that, that a dealer who's who's going to listen to this and they're going to then go back and say, <clears throat> All right, let's actually review this. You know, there, there's some real money on the table. Let's review it and see what our process looks like. Um, you know, are, are there any kind of like top three, top five things to look for? I think a big one is going to be a, a relationship between the warranty admin and the technician and the advisor, right? We th They have to be on the same page. They have to have an open communication line to discuss some of the issues that they're, the warranty admin is seeing on the on the RO. And um, one of the things that we really preach is not all these warranty admins have a technical skill set or background like a, a technician does. So um, the way I always explain it to our, our clients and, and dealers is uh, write the RO up like you're explaining it to your grandma. If your grandma can understand this, um, anybody really should. And, and at the end of the day, that is what these manufacturers are looking for because the people in the warranty departments for each manufacturer probably don't have the technical background and skill set either. So, um, you know, if we just, if we do that 
front-loaded, it just makes for a more streamlined and efficient process with um, inside of your store. Uh, I, I would say communication um, between the advisor and technician as well. Uh, you know, the, the advisor has to, on that initial write-up, has to get pertinent information from the customer. We have to have a good write-up so our technicians can properly test these cars to make sure that they're getting the same errors that the customer has. That's that's a big customer satisfaction piece there. Um, I, I would say those are my top two. I, yeah, I mean, there's a lot that play into the warranty side of our business, right? You know, having accurate concerns, causes, corrections, what what actually is wrong with the, the vehicle that the manufacturer should pay for uh, that repair. Uh, so the, the better the product on the front end, makes the warranty administrator's job much, much easier for looking up those labor op operations, closing that RO in a timely manner and submitting it to the manufacturer. Every manufacturer grades the, the dealership on how fast are you gonna get that claim submitted to me? Uh, and if you're not meeting that, that number, that could potentially create a problem or an audit with the, uh, with the store. Yeah. So, take you back on that. Uh, a lot of these manufacturers now with the trend reports are starting to, to grade you on first time through rate. Um, so, so that's becoming a, a bigger deal to have, have it going through the first time correctly and, and not throwing it up against the wall like Jason said before and hoping it sticks. That's, that's not flying with these manufacturers anymore. Yeah, so thinking about that and thinking about when I was listening to you um, kind of describe the areas that we need to be conscious of, a couple of them that stood out to me were really um, predicated on the idea of, of manual entry, right? So the advisor has to take information, ingest information from the consumer. Um, they have to kind of type it into the RO um, or certainly write it down, but would probably type it, right? Um, and then the advisor, or I'm sorry, the technician has to type out uh, complaint cost correction, so CCC. Um, so thinking about those things, uh, what role, if any, do you guys think templating some of that stuff plays, right? Is there is there a standard like, hey, when this work comes in, here's how we document that, here's what the complaint cost correction is. Does it make sense, especially in a warranty world, you know, are there certain words or phrases that we can kind of copy and paste almost um, to make sure that they're consistent and they go through? Um, so I don't know, what, what are your thoughts? What are your thoughts on that? Or, or is this truly a, you know, everyone's got to be thought through and typed out? No, I don't think everything needs to be, you know, it can be cookie cutter. It can have a template uh, that, you know, if the customer came in, here's like a word track that you would use. So uh, the famous thing is like noises. Uh, you know, an advisor is meeting a customer says, hey, Mr. Customer, why are you, uh, why are you in here for service today? Hey, my, I got a squeak in my left rear wheel. Okay, great. And they write it up. I've got a squeak in my left rear wheel. Well, the technician is going like, you're missing important information. Like, is it going over bumps? Is it the speed that it, uh, you start hearing this at? Is it when it's hot or when it's cold? So some of those items you do need to get pretty granular and ask, you know, these interrogating questions to the customer so that you're helping your technician out. But, you know, if the check engine light's on, the check engine light's on, you know, you can say, <laughs> well, when did it come on? But no matter what, the check engine light's on now, so that's what's wrong with my car. So right. some of that can be cookie cuttered and, and added as a template, but some of it is interrogating questions of the customer if it may be an intermittent concern or something in that nature. Do you think there's value in um, having kind of a question tree for your advisors where, hey, if this, then this, where, you know, you can kind of walk them through that questioning strategy or, I mean, I've seen some um, you know, some stores that'll even have software that'll kind of walk you through, walk the customer through, right? Like, Hey, what's going on with the vehicle? Um, do you find value in that? Do you think that that's an important aspect? Absolutely. I think a, a template or, or something that's guiding, uh, an advisor through, uh, some of the things that we, we have so many questions going through our head when we meet this customer, right? And there's so many, there's so many outside influences that can kind of distract you from, from truly asking some of the, the the pertinent questions, and you get one chance to ask those those questions. I think a template or or a little sheet that just has a, a, I call it a little cheat sheet that they can look down and reference, right? And, and it jogs their memory and they re, reminds them to ask. Uh, it, it is a great resource to have. That's good. Yeah, and, and I would even add, you know, when when we boil down to it, you know, a service advisor is a salesperson, 
That's what they're there to do, right? And and the more questions you can ask, the more equipped you're going to be to sell effectively, right? I mean, the more you know about that customer and, and their car and what the problem is, um, the more effectively you're going to be able to sell them on the service that's actually required. So yeah, we want to get this thing fixed that you came in for, but by asking those next level questions and even next level, um, you, you can kind of bring in that info to, that'll enable you as an advisor then to, to sell when it comes down to it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Good. Um, so one other thing, as, as we were kind of talking through that and thinking about templates and guides, um, do you see, and maybe you see it now, I don't know, but at least in the future, do you see an opportunity for um, artificial intelligence to, to craft some of these uh, write-ups, right? When I think about some of the stuff that we're seeing with generative AI and, um, you know, there's there's plugins for chat GPT and all these these types of things that are out there. Um, not a ton that's that's skyrocketing and taking off right now, but probably in the not too distant future, we'll, we'll see some stuff that'll come out that um, will enable that where, you know, you don't necessarily need um, somebody to type in the information. Uh, you know, you could, you could almost generate it automatically. Um, I, I don't know. Have you seen any of that or what are your thoughts on that maybe going forward too? Uh, I haven't seen anything, but you know, something like a multiple choice, uh, you know, when you're writing up an RO, that's important because again, it starts at the very beginning. If, it, if it's incorrect at the beginning, it's going to be incorrect at the end, most likely. Yeah. Uh, so having multiple choice, okay, so you've got a squeak, I'm um, writing it up for a squeak, okay, now when you're writing up that RO in the DMS, uh, it's going to prompt you to answer certain questions by multiple choice. Is it over bumps? Is it, you know, at a certain speed? Is it when it's hot or cold? Because, I mean, advisors are busy. On the drive, they've got calls coming in, they've got customers, they're trying to make, uh, you know, make sure they're happy and taken care of. They've got their service manager saying, why aren't you selling too much? Technicians are bringing them, hey, I need you to, you know, call a customer with this estimate. Uh, so trying to make their lives a little bit easier for the write-up, because it's about, you know, taking that time and making sure you're getting all the right information, because if you don't do it right now, the end result's not going to be accurate either. So just speeding up that process, but also giving them options to choose from versus trying to think in their head, what questions do I need to ask this customer? Yeah. Yeah. And leaving that stuff on the table too, not, not asking the questions obviously has the potential at least to slow down uh, your efficiency in the shop, right? If you got a technician who's having to diag something that he's got virtually zero information on versus something that he's got all the information on, um, you can, you know, there's, there's whatever, call it seven things that are causing that squeak that you mentioned, right? And if, if you can get down to where the first thing that you look at is probably the right one, cause you have all the information that's speeding up your um, your process and your efficiency uh, versus it being the seventh one that you look at, right? So it's definitely got, uh, you know, trickle, trickle down effects for sure. Yeah, we see, a, we see a large amount of ROs. We process for a little over 1,300 dealerships. And it's kind of funny. We kind of joke a little bit because we see comments like uh, customer states, there's a noise. And then the cause is, is a strut. And then, hey, I replaced a strut. And it's like, but how did you, how did you know that was the noise that, the customer was complaining about. So we, we asked those questions to the store saying like, can you elaborate? How did the tech identify? Or do we even know if that's the customer's concern? So uh, again, it just boils down to getting the right information up front. Yeah, no, that's good. All right. Well, hey, let's shift gears a little bit because I'm curious on this one too. You see a lot of, um, I, I assume anyway, you tell me if I'm wrong, but uh, you help a lot of dealerships through audits, I would assume, right? Across a bunch of different manufacturers. That can be a painful process if uh, if you're not prepared for it and you haven't done the work to make sure that everything's clean up front. Um, so looking at audits, you know, maybe when you get a new customer, right? What are some of the things that you look for because you know that those are going to get caught, right? What are those, again, maybe that, that top, top list, whether it's top three, top five, whatever it is, of what are those things that you really need to pay attention to? Um, so when, not if, but when you do go through a warranty audit, um, you're, you're clean and it's extremely painless. So th there's a few easy ones that the auditors are going to come in and, and try and get right off the bat. That's technician clock time. That is going to be uh, single-use parts are a big one. We've got to make sure that our parts department is, is kitting those single-use parts out per the workshop repair manual. And, and then, in my opinion, the easiest one to fix, but the most overlooked one, would be all of the machinery that prints out a, a printout sheet. That's battery testers, AC uh, recharge machines, any of that stuff. We should be going through on a monthly basis making sure that the date and times are correct. Because if 
if something so simple is missed, that's an automatic 100% chargeback of that ticket just because we didn't check the date and time. Um, for me, I, I would hate to lose the ticket just because it was a, a few minutes off or an hour off just because I didn't take the two minutes to check it you know, that month. Um, those for me are, are big ones that uh, can really impede you and they're, they're quick, easily implemented in your uh, service department and shop. Yeah. Anything else? Any other kind of low-hanging fruit? Well, low-hanging fruit, depending on how you look at it, right? Low-hanging fruit to, to kind of fix and change, but also low-hanging fruit when an auditor comes in that they're just kind of like, all right, here's here's the stuff I'm going to look for first. Right. Yeah. Every every manufacturer has a policy and procedures manual. So uh, that doesn't mean that you just uh, disregard it. There's rules that you have to follow. Uh, so when w- whether we bring a new store on or if we're just coaching a store, we're talking to them and they're, they're asking for for some assistance, uh, you know, we, we, everything is written in the policy and procedure manual and we have to follow that. And, and the importance of it is there's a lot of, of money at risk and on the line if it's not being followed. So, you know, concern, cause and corrections, if those aren't accurate, the manufacturer has right to take that claim back. Uh, if your technician's not clocking on and off the repair, if your customer's not signing that, that document when they're, they're, uh, dropping the vehicle off. Those are easy things that an auditor just can take away right off the bat without ever even looking into the validity of the claim, if, it, if it's valid or not. You know, if the customer didn't sign it, it doesn't exist. I'm taking the money. And, and rightfully so. They have every, every right to do that because in policy, it says they have to sign uh, when they drop the vehicle off. So we, we look at it from a standpoint, we want to educate dealers. Uh, we're not here to like say, hey, you've got broken processes or you don't know how to do your job, uh, but we're trying to educate them so that they don't run into a risk of losing their hard earned money because the technician may have done everything right. The, it, the warranty may have been submitted 100% accurately, but because the part wasn't returned or because the customer didn't sign that document, that's a hard one to swallow because I did everything else right except for that one little piece that I missed a signature or a time or a date. Uh, you know, we want to educate dealers on, on these issues and what we see in the industry to help reduce that exposure in an audit. Yeah. So for a, an average dealer, what would you say, like what, what percentage of warranty ROs have an issue, right? When an audit happens, how many out of 100, right? How many of those 100 ROs? Um, end up with some sort of an issue or end up in a, in a chargeback? Yeah, I mean, I think historically, you know, it's probably going to run around 7 to 8%, 7 or 8% uh, error rate uh, in a perfect world. I mean, we all want zero, uh, but right. no one's perfect. I've never seen a dealer that had, uh, you know, zero there. Uh, but average, you went around 3%. That's the human factor there that, you know, someone missed something. Uh, and it's a learning experience, you know, that, the manufacturers aren't coming in to just rip your head off and take money from you. That's the mentality and how we look at it because we're, we're, we're getting money taken away. Right. Uh, but they're, they're there to educate too. They want a better process uh, that you're sending them and they want to educate you on, on what you need to do to correct it. So I would say, you know, average is around anywhere between seven and 8% is probably the error rate there. Man, that seems high. Like that just seems like what, you know, it's like, why is that acceptable or why, well, maybe not acceptable, but normal. Cause it just, that seems like a lot of money and it's, it's just, it seems like process stuff, right? Where yes. as long as you follow the process, you, it should be zero, right? I mean, if, cause it's not like, I, I don't think I, I haven't met a dealer who's, um, you know, dishonest or trying to steal from the manufacturer, right? If it's warranty work, it's warranty work. Uh, so why it just, it blows my mind that it's, that it's, that nobody's at zero or that, you know, we say, you know, seven, eight percent. I mean, that's almost a tenth of, of your warranty revenue that you're not going to get paid on. Right. And you're not making right. huge yeah. margins there anyway, because you got to pay your tax and everything else. So, man, that's just it seems I don't know. To me, it seems like that's that's a big opportunity. Sure. Yeah. And for the oddest, the, the dealers that we work with, we're under we're under one percent uh, in 2023. Our error rate on claims processing was under one percent, uh, which is fantastic. But that's yeah. still one percent of of your total revenue. Right. So uh, and that's where the education comes in. So when there's an audit, we review it and we coach dealers on, OK, this is what the manufacturer's policy states and where you need to clean up some of those uh, actions to get to that zero. Uh, you know, human factor is we get busy, 
uh, customer forgot this or an advisor forgot to get the customer to sign, that unfortunately does happen. Uh, you know, how many times does you go to a restaurant and you didn't sign your, your credit card receipt when you're paying your bill? Uh, it does happen. Uh, but uh, we do want to shore up any of those those problems to reduce that exposure. Well, I think it's changing, it's changing mindset, right? It's, it's the conversation we had at the be beginning of this, of this was uh, warranty has been an afterthought. We want it to be on the forefront of your mind because if, if you're always thinking about that, you're prepared, you're not going to miss the, the small things. You're, you're going to be prepared for, for those little things and, and have a plan of action on, on how we can resolve these instead of fixing it after we get charged back. Let's not have them charge us back for these things instead. Um, and I think people are starting to catch on to that because they're realizing how much money there is to be made in warranty and how many warranty dollars are out there uh, for these dealers to collect. Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about, um, I guess, size and scale and, and things like that. When when I'm a dealer, uh, well, I guess in your guys' experience, because I, I assume not every dealer has a warranty administrator, right? I mean, it's they, they do, but it's not not necessarily a full-time job, right? It's it's somebody that's doing that plus, plus, plus. Um, yeah. So at what volume does it make sense to have a full-time warranty administrator? Because just, just listening and being a part of this conversation, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of pieces to the puzzle and just knowledge that you need to have, right? You talk about the procedures and policies manual, like, you know, what, what are those things? What are those steps? And, and, you know, at some point it makes sense for that to be somebody's job so that they're very efficient at that job, right? Because if, every time you got to go look it up, um, that's going to slow you down. So mm -hmm. I guess long winded way of asking, you know, is there a, a threshold where for a dealership typically, and you know, every, everybody's different, but typically it makes sense to at least start thinking about a full-time warranty administrator, whether that's in-house or whether that's using a company like, like what you guys are a part of. Um, but just in general, uh, you know, is there, is there an RO count or a dollar amount or I don't know what, what have you seen? So I don't really think there's like, uh, you know, at what point do I need to whether look for an experienced warranty admin or hire an outside service? Uh, I think it really boils down to how is that process working for them? Okay. Uh, I mean, even if they're a really low volume store, if the person that's doing the job isn't doing it correctly, uh, they've been charged back for, for some things on an audit or their time to submit is, is suffering, right? I mean, the dealership's waiting on that money, but the admin hasn't submitted it over, whether they're too busy, they don't have the skill set to do it, their knowledge, or it's a complicated claim. So I think a lot of it boils down to is like the need is when uh, they're finding that they're not getting their money uh, in a timely manner, uh, and they're struggling with trying to figure out, okay, how do I actually do this job? Uh, it, it's important to have the right person uh, doing that because of that, that money that we talked about earlier is there's 40 percent of your department uh, in the service department is related to warranty so uh, you want to get as much as you can from that manufacturer they're willing to pay you you just got to make sure that you're doing the right thing do you see i think it's more about identifying the right person right if you're going to have if you're going to have that person wearing multiple different hats that person should be able to manage those different hats that they're wearing so it's not necessarily a dollar amount when you hit this dollar amount you should have an in-house person it's finding that right person that fits your your dealer mentality right and and the way you guys operate and do business um you you want to find somebody that kind of fits into that flow so you can plug them in and they do have to be experienced they do have to have the knowledge because we're working in an evolving industry that's changing on a daily basis. Um, and it's a lot of work just to keep up with all of the changes that come out with, whether it's a TSB bulletin, a recall, they're ever evolving as they're gathering information. So, you know, it could be one way one day and then the next day it could be completely different. Um, and, and we just have to have somebody that's adaptable to those situations. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. So really, it's there's there's a bunch of different ways to do it, right? And not one of them is quote unquote the right way. Uh, you just need to make sure that your team is is getting everything done that needs to be done and getting it done effectively and efficiently and, and accurately. Probably most important. Correct. Right? Yeah, yep. it's good. Absolutely. 
Um, what about what about speed? So when I think about um, you know shifting gears from the the mentality of audits and things like that, when I think about just getting paid, um, you know, for for receivables, warranty receivables, um, what are some ways? Well, maybe first, what's what's a reasonable expectation for for turnaround time uh, for for warranty receivables? Yeah, so uh, uh, we look at it at a standpoint of twenty four hours. So twenty four hours from the time that the technician has completed his repair, uh, we will review the RO for compliance to make sure that you know the the concern caused correction, tech story parts, the required information is there. Uh, and we will close, submit, and get that claim paid within 24 hours. Um, you know, some claims take a little bit longer depending on uh, the severity of the claim. Uh, and if it has a compliance issue, getting that compliance issue resolved before you close that RO. Uh, you don't want to close something out of compliance and then submit it because guess what? That's probably going to be either a debit or a chargeback uh, later on. So within 24 hours, that claim should be submitted over to the manufacturer for payment. And then Cash how, flow is important. It, it is, it is. And then, um, you know, how do you, I guess, how do you track your receivables or what, what are some of the best practices, right? From uh, really almost an accounting perspective on, on tracking the receivables, make sh- making sure you're getting paid uh, because, you know, on the manufacturer side too, it's not like this is all automated, right? They're reviewing okay. these things. There are people involved. Um, if something is more complex, it certainly can take a while, right? So um, it's not just, you know, you don't have a bunch of people just sitting there going, yep, pay, yep, pay. Um, so so how do you effectively manage receivables and track that, especially on the ones that just seem to be lingering out there? How do you how do you make sure to get that money money in the bank? Yeah, so the, the, the two matrix or the two areas we focus on is work and process, what's ready, what's sitting out there, that's open, and then what's on the warranty schedule. So reviewing that warranty schedule, uh, you know, whether it's daily, weekly, whatever that looks like for, for AWN or for a car dealership, uh, it's important to monitor, monitor those two areas because if it's closed and on the schedule and there's no movement, the dealer's sitting here waiting for payment. Maybe the admin's, you know, struggling with that claim and it's 14, 15 days old. Uh, the dealer's waiting on that income. Uh, most likely they paid their employees, the techs, the advisors, but yet they haven't received their money yet. So it's really important to monitor that warranty schedule because if it hasn't cleared that schedule yet, that means you haven't received your money. Uh, and then also in the OEM site, so whether it's Ford or Chrysler, whichever manufacturer it is, uh, you know, if it's rejected, that claim hasn't been paid. Why is it, why is it rejected? And there's a timeline on that rejection. You know, how long is it taking your person to resolve that correction? It should be within 24 hours, the same thing, like within 24 hours of it being rejected, that claim should be resubmitted and and seeking payment on it again. So uh, we see it a lot of times where schedules are reviewed maybe on a monthly basis. Well, if it's sitting on the schedule and there's no activity, no one's touching it, that's just a month of just sitting there like a dead claim. You have to stay on top of that warranty schedule. It's so important. You- when working them, working them weekly or daily will help with your your cost as well. Because let's say you have let's say you have a parts markup issue. If you're working your schedule once a month, you're taking a whole lot of write offs or adjustments, I should say. Um, versus if you're working it weekly or daily, you're able to catch those a lot quicker as those credit memos are being posted. These things are coming off your schedule. If you have a lot of re- small balances remaining, you need to dig in to, as to why those are there. Let's let's find out what is causing that to not pay exactly what we have the RO closed at, and, and let's fix that. Let's fix it sooner than later. I, I would rather have to do an adjustment on two or three ROs versus thirty or forty for the month, because um, you're having to eat that at retail, not at not at your cost. Right. Do you see um, that review as something that um, needs to be done for the entire schedule or is this something that you manage by exception, right? Do you set up rules where, hey, if something's more than three days old or or whatever it is or or seven days old, then we need to review it? Or are you reviewing the entire thing, every claim, every single day or every single, you know, every single week, whatever the time frame is? Yeah, so we uh, we most manufacturers, they pay either daily, weekly, and some of them are monthly, but you can still see the claim status, whether it's paid, but they just haven't released the funds yet. We work schedules every week for our, our customers. Uh, and the reason for that is because 
of just like you said, we have to make sure that it's just not sitting in their, sitting in their schedule with no activity. We're going to put notes next to each item. And if it's pending, we're going to check that claim the next day to see, okay, has it now been paid? Uh, because the importance and our focus is what AWN focuses on is, and most dealerships are going to want claims paid fast, accurately, and compliantly. So if, if, if we're missing a portion of that, we're not doing our company a justice or the dealership that we're working for any justice. So we really, every, every day counts on a warranty claim. Yeah. When I would argue that we need to look at the, the age claims first, right? Because we, we are going to have time restraints on, on either uh, resubmitting them, appealing them. And if, if we've had something sitting there 30, 60, 90 days, well, I would have liked my money 30, 60, 90 days ago. So let's, let's work the age stuff first. Uh, let's get those answered. Let's get those cleaned up. Um, let's, if we need to find somebody to get some more information on, uh, digging through our boxes to find the, the supporting documentation, whatever it is, let's get that taken care of. Well, also, we got to manage the current as well. But, you know, my, my priority would be the, the age items on that schedule. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Um, well, guys, this has been uh, been a fun conversation. I think, again, something that probably doesn't get talked about enough, right? It's just not out there that much. So I appreciate yeah. you taking the time yep. to do it. Uh, but what haven't we touched on that uh, that you want to? Anything else that you want to cover while we have a minute? No, I, I would just say for like any car dealership, if you want to kind of score your admin and say like, how how is my admin uh, doing effectively in my store? Uh, two things that they would want to look for is, is how is your open RO? Is your, is your whip? Uh, in line or you got a lot of age claims that they haven't touched yet. And then also the greatest one of all is, is the warranty schedule. Is it clean? Is it current? Do you have things over 30, 60, 90 days? Uh, if you've got stuff sitting over 30, 60, 90 days, that's a problem. Uh, we see a lot of times stores come on with us where, you know, they ask the question, well, are you going to be able to help me with the, the claims that are on my schedule? And my question is answered at that point, why they're reaching out to me? Uh, because maybe that was overlooked. So if you want to score your admin, you want a good scorecard uh, for what your admin's doing in the stores to look at their open RO list and then also look at that warranty schedule. That's so important. Dealers are entitled to that money. The manufacturer is willing to pay it. And if it's just sitting there, someone has neglected to do something. So it's very important to look at that warranty schedule. Very good. Very good. Well, Jake Trot, Jason Tuck, thank you very much for joining me today. It was a, it was a ton of fun, a great conversation, and uh, we'll, we'll hopefully talk again soon. Awesome. Thanks for having us. All right. Thanks, guys. Well, that was a great conversation with Jake Trot and Jason Tuck from AWN. I appreciate them coming on. Again, warranty uh, warranty work and, and warranty submissions uh, aren't, aren't always top of mind, and, and they just don't get talked about a lot. Um, so I appreciate them coming on and, and having the conversation today. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope it was valuable for you. Uh, before we hop off, don't forget, you can watch or listen to all episodes of Connected on YouTube, Apple, and Spotify podcasts. And make sure to hit subscribe so you're notified every other week when new episodes are released. Thanks so much, and we'll see you in two weeks.